Hey everybody! Today, Rado revisits his top 10 worker placement games, which is a wonderful topic to come back to. Five years ago, I did my first top 10 list, and at the time, it uh, was a bit controversial, I guess, caused uh, quite the firestorm. There was a bit of a brouhaha about it, because I didn't go the standard way. Because games that are in my top 10 of all time, like, say, Agricola, did not make my top 10 worker placement list, even though it's a worker placement game. And that's because... Well... I'm going to do it again, so I feel like I should explain this right up front. Just because a game is phenomenal doesn't necessarily mean it's a phenomenal worker placement experience. That's the problem with Agricola. It's one of my favorite games of all time. It's just a so-so worker placement game. It doesn't really do anything interesting or inventive or exciting uh, with worker placement. And I remember getting into arguments about this half a decade ago on this topic, and so I'm trying to cut those off at the pass ahead of time here. Um, like, if you were to think of movies... And um, 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 The Truman Show. The Truman Show is widely regarded as one of the greatest comedy films of all time. It is a comedy. It's, a, it's an amazing film. And I would certainly rate it one of the best movies I've seen ever. Certainly one of the best Jim Carrey movies. But I wouldn't call it one of the best comedies. If I were making a top 10 comedies, I wouldn't put it on there. Because it honestly doesn't make me laugh that much. I appreciate the humor that's in it. But... I laugh a lot more at Ace Ventura when it boils right down to it. And um, so even though Truman Show is a better movie, it's a greater piece of art, it's not a greater comedy than something as ridiculous and lowbrow uh, as uh, you know Ace Ventura, which focuses like a laser on the comedy, and that's all it does. So these 10 games I'm about to talk about, they are a countdown of games that I think just do the most amazing, cool, exciting new stuff with worker placement. And to my way of thinking, that makes them better worker placement games than um, you know some classics like Agricola that are wonderful, wonderful experiences experiences, but they're just so-so in terms of the actual worker placement mechanism. So, with that out of the way, let's start with number 10. And this is actually a tie, but I'm going to give it to Tale of Pirates, which is so cool because it is a real-time worker placement game. And also, it's a cooperative worker placement. These are two things that, when worker placement was just starting out, I think would be completely unthinkable. Um, you know, But now, uh, we, we've got Tale of Pirates. And also, this could have easily gone to Kitchen Rush as well. Another other great will time cooperative workplace. And I know there's some other ones on the market and some more that are coming too, uh, because they have this central idea of your workers being hourglasses. And so you put them down, the worker gets to work, and you have to wait until they're done before you can put them somewhere else. That so brings the idea of a worker actually doing work to life. Because I can, you know, obviously this is not a, a video game, but I almost feel like I can see them working because I'm watching the timer in that hourglass countdown before I can take them and move them somewhere else because we need to get a lot of work done in a very short period of time. It is such a cool idea. It is so revolutionary compared to um, Kalis or something like that. And it really brings worker placement alive in, in a way that nothing else does, which is why it makes the list. And number 10, Tale of Pirates. Or like I said, I could have easily given this to Kitchen Rush as well. Now, moving on to number 9. Um, these are both games, because again, I'm going to do another tie, that with looking back, I probably should have put these on the original list. I'm thinking specifically of Lancaster or Carson City. But I'm going to give the nod to Lancaster um, because the things that makes these special, worker placement games where your workers fight. Where I might go on ahead and send my worker out to do a thing, but there's no guarantee he's going to get that done because somebody else could send their own workers to displace mine. That's a really cool idea. And it might be odd uh, for a Care Bear like me to put that on the list. But the reason um, Lancaster works for me and Jen, in spite of the fact that a lot of people consider it a very aggressive cutthroat game, is we don't look at it as any different than an auction. Oh, yeah, I'll send my uh, worker over to... Uh, to um, Lancashire or whatever to, to do whatever or Devon or whatever the action I'm trying to do is um, and I know if I do that you might choose to bump me out so I can supplement that uh, that night uh, in, in um, oh what is it I forget what era of English history this is set in, but I could supplement that night with a couple of squires so I have a stronger hold that's me just making a bid of three and 
I don't hold it against other players if they decide to outbid me and I end up getting my stuff back to send elsewhere. So, um, you know, while there, like I said, there is a bit of cutthroat nature to it, for us, it works really well. And again, it's doing cool, interesting stuff. These workers are more than just pawns. It's, they, they, they have an extra level of depth and complexity to them because they have strength. How well can they hold their spot? Carson City does the same thing in a very different way because there's actually battles that take place between the workers before one of them gets kicked out by the other. And ultimately, I do think I prefer the Lancaster, the more deterministic approach, uh, uh, because, it, it again, it feels more like an auction and less like a battle or a fight. Uh, but either way, uh, this is a really... Really, really cool idea. This notion of uh, workers that can um, basically um, duel for the work they're trying to do. So that would be number nine, Lancaster. Uh, number eight. Uh, this is another cool idea I really, really love that you can see in Viticulture, although it also uh, makes an appearance famously in Lords of Waterdeep. But I'll go with Viticulture and talk about... Oh, what would you even call it? It's this notion that there are multiple phases in a worker's life. Uh, both of these games pretty much on the surface, work like a regular worker placement game. I got my worker, I put it somewhere on the board, I do that action, my, uh, and now that space is blocked, nobody else can go there until the worker eventually clears out via whatever mechanism it is. So that's all very well and cool. But both of these games have the idea that after all the workers are placed, that's just the first stage. Then, um, in the case of uh, Waterdeep, workers that specifically went to the harbor, but in the case of Viticulture, several of the workers have the opportunity to move to other spots. Um, you know, they, they have this cycle. In, in Viticulture, they do their summer stuff and then their winter stuff on practically a different board. Um, Waterdeep, it's more, hey, you put all the workers out and then the ones who went to the dock can now go to other spaces. Other games have done this as well, and I absolutely love this idea that you're getting more out of your workers. Again, it's not just a simple, oh, I put the worker out, I do the stuff. Uh, they have more of a life. I'm, they are capable of producing more. And now, of course, on top of that, Viticulture did a lot of other really cool things, different types. You know, if you remember the old Grande, and uh, who actually over the years went through different shifts into how he actually functionally works. But those are extra elements that really elevate Viticulture and make it. Uh, well, hey, it's one of the most popular, well-loved worker placement games of all time. I'd be remiss not to mention it. But it's uh, not just that it's a great game; is that it does something really cool and wonderful with worker placement. It's interesting. Uh, last time I put Euphoria, uh, which introduced the idea of worker bumping on my list. And, uh, you know, so Jamie Stegmeier, the designer of both Euphoria and Viticulture, well, he's a... Uh He's really no learned uh, how to do very cool and interesting outside-the-box ideas with worker placement. So, that was number seven, Viticulture or Lords of Waterdeep, if you prefer. And again, there are other games that do this, but these are the ones that really popularize these ideas. Then, um, oops, I'm sorry, that was number eight. Number seven... Oh... This one's going to be kind of iffy, folks. I think a lot of people might take exception to me putting the colonists on the list. Although the ideas of the colonists that you also see in a lot of games like uh, Vinos or, or Merlin or Yokohama is a really good example. It's the idea of a worker placement game where you are very strictly restricted as to how you can place your worker. Most worker placement games, you put the worker on the board and eventually they get pulled off and then they can go do some other job elsewhere. In a... Uh, Oh, what would you call it? A uh, location-based work? What would you... Um, a tra uh, travel? I'm, I'm not even quite sure what to call this, but the idea where I put my worker on the board, and now, when it's my turn again, I can um, put that worker elsewhere, but it has to be someplace adjacent to where he just was. So... Functionally, it means I've got a worker who is literally traveling around the board, moving from worker placement spot to worker placement spot, and a big part of my overall strategy is plotting a course for that worker, knowing that, okay, if he goes here, and then over here, and then over here, and then over here, that's going to make a really great combo chain of actions. But I am restricted. I can't just go from here to here. Although these games generally give you some ways to like skip around or whatnot. Um, but... That is so awesome because, again, it adds this extra layer on top of traditional worker placement. Yes, these are workers because once he's blocking the space, nobody else can go there. And again, these other games, you know, um, Vinos does it in a way where... Um, yeah, in fact, actually, you could almost say any... Uh 
Rondell game arguably is a worker placement game of sorts because this is another example where um, yeah you you put a worker down to do an action and then you have to move clockwise along this rondelle to do another worker placement action. So like I said, this is maybe a bit, maybe this is a bit too broad, but um, when I was basically did a search for worker placement games from 2014 to 2019 on Board Game Geek and I saw oh Colonus makes a list. Yeah, I never thought about it. That's totally a worker placement game. And it's so cool the way it does worker placement. Such a breath of fresh air. And like I said, there's other games that do it in different ways. I love especially Yokohama, the notion of, again, it's a worker that moves around from position to position, but the positions it moves to is based on you pre-programming the spots it goes to by first sending out employees of the main worker, your, your president of your corporation. Really cool ideas here. This is such a wonderful evolution of the core idea of worker placement where you are spa let's call it spatial worker placement because you're spatially bound based on what you've done before I absolutely love it and um, rarely has it been done better than my number seven the colonists and then we go on to number six a feast for Odin. Yes, finally, Uwe Rosenberg, you know, a lot of people would consider him the king of worker placement games, makes the list. And it's with one of his uh, most loved games. And I gotta say, folks, I am super duper impressed by uh, Feast for Odin. Um, but even more so now that the uh, Norwegian expansion comes out. So there are two levels of worker placement greatness to this game that I absolutely adore. One is the fact that you you get a big, big old bunch of workers when you start playing this game, much more so than your average worker placement game. But you need them because a lot of the spaces you can go to, you can't just place one worker there. You got to place two or three. And so it is very expensive to do certain actions. Um, but those are the really good actions. You can often do weaker versions of those actions by choosing a different worker placement spot, but you only send one. And so that tension of, do I go for the really big space that gobbles up half of my workforce? Or do I try to do a whole bunch of little actions, all the while dealing with the fundamental tension that is uh, really defines worker placement to a large degree, scarcity of spaces. Because as these spaces get gobbled up, well, maybe I can't get all the little spaces I want. Maybe it does make more sense to go for the really big one and um, you know finish the round early. So just that is awesome. But added on top of that in the Norwegian's expansion, they have this extra space. There's an extra set of worker placement spots you can go to that are very cheap. Um, they're, they're, they're as powerful as the spaces where you have to send like a ton of workers, and yet you only have to send one worker there or two workers there, uh, and yet they're so powerful, so why wouldn't everybody use those worker placement spaces all the time? Wouldn't Norman go first? Because the problem is, as soon as you send your workers to any of those, your round is over. And so, if you still have other workers you want to do, you gotta you spend all of those first, in, you know, with all the regular tension of the original Feast for Odin, but now there's this race to get your workers deployed fast so that you can eventually activate one of those round ending ones that are super powerful and yet super cheap. This ratchets up the tension even higher and creates so much wonderful, delightful decision making. Um, it is it is definitely Feast for Odin is uh, designer Uwe Rosenberg's uh, pinnacle achievement in the world of worker placement. Don't get me wrong, I still think Agricola is the better game, but that's for other reasons, not the worker placement. Feast for Odin is was fantastic. With Norwegians, it's amazing, which is why it made my number six. But now let's move on to number five, Anachrony. This game is so far out. A worker placement game where um, you can basically use your workers to borrow goods from the future that when the future comes, you eventually have to send to yourself. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on. But what makes the worker placement so cool in this game? There are two things I love in Anachrony related to the worker placement. One, not all workers are created equal. You have different types of workers. Scientists versus engineers and um, whatnot. And um, uh, you know, versus managers. Uh, um, and depending on what workers you have, they will activate a given worker placement spot in completely different ways. This extra puzzle on top of worker placement really elevates our anachrony just right there in and of itself. But uh, they were not done with, uh, with pushing worker placement to the limit here because 
There is this thematic notion that to be able to send your workers to the major city where most of the worker placement spots are, where you compete to be the first to grab the traditional worker placement spots, you can't just say, oh, I'll just put whatever worker I want there. You have to literally if you get the deluxe version of this game, put your workers in these cool mech suits because they have to travel from your own home base to the city. And um, to be able to do that, you have to uh, power up the mechs and you have to make this investment in your workers' ability to be able to do a worker placement action later on. You have to commit these resources at the beginning of a round before you know if your worker will even be able to make it where you want him to go. That one-two step is so cool because if you don't want to make that investment to send your workers to the capital city, um, you know, across this post-apocalypse hellscape to be able to, uh, to to achieve the main stuff, you could just keep your workers at home and just place them on your own board and um, not get as much stuff done, but guarantee what you're going to get done. These are both awesome ideas. They combine together to make Anachrony one of the most clever, original, um, innovative worker placement games ever, which is why it made my number five. Anachrony. But let's move on to number four. And uh, Spirium is l from the same designer as the granddaddy of worker placement, Kalis. Oh, I've totally forgotten the uh, designer's name. And now that's going to drive me nuts. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking this up. Uh, right. Designer Sp uh, Spirium. Let's look that up. Uh, William Attia. Yes. Um, yeah, William Attia didn't invent worker placement with Kalis, but he popularized the idea. Kalis became the blueprint um, that would ultimately go on to be what is arguably the most popular Euro mechanism in board gaming today. So we owe so much to William Attia for his masterful breakthrough design in Kalis. Even if it wasn't a game for me and Jen because it's way too cutthroat. Um, so... Imagine how happy I was when, many years later, William returned to worker placement to completely flip the script, reinvent the wheel, by mixing worker placement with area control. Because in this game, you don't put your workers on the worker placement spots to do the actions, you put them adjacent to the worker placement spots. You have a grid, actually, it's a, the worker placement is kind of randomly generated, the board you place on, because this grid of cards, and when you place a worker between two cards, that means this worker could do this action, or this action. And ultimately, what they're going to be involved in depends on how many workers get spread all over the place. Because like I said, there's kind of this area control as players are trying to exert dominance over these different worker uh, placement spots. These cards to trigger all these actions that you want to do. Typical Euro stuff. You know, goods gathering and conversion. So cool. Really a super sharp design. And oh, it is such a shame that it is so overlooked. The father of worker placement, although not the originator, I think that honor goes to Bus. I've never played it from, is it from Splatterspiel? I forget. Anyway, um, but you know, Mr. Worker Placement, Mr. Kalis comes back um, and like just blows the door off worker placement, does something so cool and new and original. I, I would be ashamed if I did not put it on my list. Um, but I can feel happy doing it because it's an amazing. Amazing experience. Uh, Bocha and I absolutely love my number four, Spirium. Then we move on to number three, a uh, fairly recent game, which also, like Spirium, kind of fell between the cracks. It's a real shame that Chimera Station hasn't gotten more love because there are two really awesome worker placement uh, advancements and innovations in this game. Let's talk about the first one. The board itself. This is a game where players are all collaboratively working to build a space station. And every module we put on the space station becomes a new worker placement spot where we can activate to build even more of the space station and score points. Um, fair enough. Uh, but that's a that's a really cool idea. The fact that this worker placement board is built by the players themselves. It is not set. It's going to be different every time you play. Um, actually, you saw a little bit of this in The Colonist. I mentioned this earlier as well, where your worker placement board is... I should have mentioned it there too. Uh, credit where credit is due. But that in and of itself is awesome. Uh, a worker placement board where you build it. But that's not what put it on the list. That's not what put it so high here at number three. Uh, it's the workers. The workers in Chimera Station are the craziest, funkiest workers the board game industry has ever seen. They are these aliens that we can kind of tamper with their DNA and um, give them different attributes so they get better and worse at certain things. I mentioned, what was it, on... Um, 
viticulture and uh, anachrony, the idea of workers who are better at some actions than others. That's a, a cool idea. But how about customizable workers that you can combine di different heads with different torsos, with different um, feet that all give them different things like being able to activate multiple spaces at once and bump each other. All kinds of cool things that your worker force, by the time a game is over, is radically different than mine, but not because of you know some design from the designers, but because of the choices I made. Chimera Station, it has great production value. It's a it's just a great game on its own, but this extra thing that pushes it over the top, being able to design your own workers, oh, oh it so deserves so much more love. And uh, but Jen, I love it. It's my number three, Chimera Station. Now, number two, uh, we're gonna have another double feature. Uh, because while I'm going to give the nod to Teotihuacan, which was a big monster Euro hit from last year, this could just as easy, easily go to its predecessor and inspiration, Praetor. Both of these games um, are worker placement games. But, and you know, and they do different things. Uh, TLT Walkin is also a game that kind of borrows from what I was talking about earlier, this kind of spatial worker placement, because it's a worker placement kind of slash rondelle game. Um, but that, that's not what makes these games interesting. What makes these interesting is your worker's age. Uh, at the beginning, because they're represented by dice. Every time you place a worker, you know, you, you set them at a level one, they do a level one day's work. Um, but over the course of the game, they will upgrade, become do a level two, a level three, a level four. And so they get progressively more powerful the more you use them. And this is represented so beautifully and elegantly just by changing the face of the die that's sticking up after they do their actions. Both these games do it. And if that weren't enough, that would have been enough right there. Oh, the idea of, okay, do I uh, just keep using my... Uh, do I focus on making one worker really strong? Or do I just try to use a whole bunch of weaker workers all over the place? That in of itself would be enough to warrant inclusion on this list. But they go further. Because in both of these games, you have the idea of the workers getting so old they retire and they are removed from your workforce. But as a result, you get really, really big bonuses. I love these ideas. It goes back to what I was talking about all of these games, wherever they can um, implement something new, where they can change the formula from William Attia, from Kalis, to make these workers feel more real, more alive, more like actual characters I'm controlling rather than just pawns, I love it. And the idea, it's so um, you know evocative. These workers, they get better the more they work, but they will eventually grow old and die or retire, or whatever you want to call it. It just, uh, it just tickles my funny bone. Uh, and we absolutely love both of these games. Uh, Teotihuacan, the newer one. Praetor, Praetor, the older one. But still, that's my number two. Teotihuacan. But finally, the number one. My new uh, top dog. These are both games that came out last year alongside Teotihuacan. So, uh, 2018 was a great year for worker placement innovation. Um, both of these games have a new idea for worker placement um, that really flips the script. They both do it in very different ways, but I gotta give dual credit to Gugong and Underwater Cities because these games have you place workers in the form of a hand of cards. Instead of just a bunch of tokens that I can put out on the board and do various actions, I have a hand of cards that represent uh, such a huge assortment of functionally different worker types who are capable of doing different things. This is an idea that has been touched on in other games like Anachrony or, um, or Chimera Station. But the idea that these games can come with a big old deck of cards um, that are full of cards that do interesting different stuff that all of these workers can be unique and different. Um, but And th then I've got a handful of cards. Which workers, which cards, am I going to send out where on the board to trigger the main board actions I need to do? It... I. It is the epitome of what I'm talking about. That these workers, or functional workers, because uh, Gugong, they call them gift cards instead of worker cards, but they might as well be. Functionally, they're workers. Oh, I love it so much. Um, both of these games, you know, that's just the start. They both do very different things. If I had to give the nod to one or the other, I'd put Gugong on the top, because it also has this idea of um, workers bumping other workers based on their relative strengths. If there is already a worker on a spot and it's a value 2, I can bump it, thereby claiming the old worker by putting a 3 to do the new action. But if the uh, worker I want to bump is actually more powerful than mine, then I gotta pay extra to trigger the bump. But hey, as a result, I paid extra to get a stronger worker in the future. Oh my gosh. 
So brilliant. Um, Underwater City is equally brilliant in different ways. Um, it's amazing. Both of these came out uh, back to back. I, I, both of them made my top 10 of uh, 2018, as did Teotihuacan, if I recall correctly, which is uh, amazing because, folks, I, as much as I'm waxing rhapsodic about how much I love worker placement, worker placement is not my favorite worker, uh, you know, uh, play. it didn't even make my top 10 gameplay mechanisms when I did that list. My top 10 games of, um, or no, my top 10 must-have games, if I recall correctly, didn't include a single worker placement game. So I like worker placement. I don't love it. I really like it a lot. And what I do love is when designers and developers and publishers push the envelope, and don't just rest on their laurels, don't just give us yet another retread of what William Attia was doing um, over a decade ago, but um, give us something new and cool and exciting and push the art form forward. And that's it, folks. My new top 10. It just in no way, shape, or form replaces my old ones. Um, the original top 10, which, by the way, you can uh, hit that eye up in the top right corner of the screen to go check out. Um, those were 10 amazing ones from before. These are 10 new amazing ones, and I look forward to seeing how the work placement genre continues to evolve as we move into the future. And that's the top 10, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.